I'd ask you if you would turn in your Bibles, please, to John chapter 2. John chapter 2. By way of, of background here, um, and for those who aren't familiar with me, uh, particularly, um, the last time I was here, I think, was August 2023. And on that occasion in the evening, I turned to John chapter 3. Um, it's a very, very rich chapter of God's word, as we shall see. To me, there is more than one address that can be gleaned from it. And so this evening, whilst some of you might remember that it's basically the same passage that I read a year ago, although that's a bit of a long shot in itself, uh, I do ask that you would bear with me and we seek to draw more uh, from that passage once again. So it's John uh, chapter 2, and we're going to read on into chapter 3. Um, if you were looking for a title for the sermon, it would be, You Must Be Born Again. But John chapter 2, let's begin our reading at verse 23. Now when he, that is Jesus, was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. But Jesus on his part did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and needed no one to bear witness about man for he himself knew what was in man. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people loved the darkness rather than the light, because their works were evil. 
For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. Amen. Ending at the end of verse 21. If you'd like to, to keep that passage open in front of you, that will be the focus of our, our study this evening. In an obituary from the Times newspaper of the 27th of March, 2023, I was reminded of one Willie Bell. I recognized the name and the subheading confirmed who it was. It read, footballer who played a key role in Don Revy's revolution at Leeds United. But it was the second part of the subheading that particularly caught my eye <coughs> and who later ran a Christian ministry in prisons. Let me explain a little bit more. I have a, a dim memory of Willie Bell as a Scottish left back in what became a formidable Leeds team in the late 1960s and the first half of the 1970s. And the obituary informed me that Willie Bell joined Leeds United in 1960, earning £8 per week. Let's not even think about what these footballers earn today. He played twice for Scotland, including in a one-all draw with Brazil and Pele in 1966 in front of a crowd of 75,000. And the obituary described how he later went in to football management in 1978. By then he realized that he had been neglecting his family. And after becoming born again, while helping to run a football summer camp in Colorado in 1976, he decided to shift his priorities. Quote, after that, it was the Lord, my family, and football in that order, he said. In later years, he and his wife founded Within the Walls, a Christian ministry that offered a combination of the gospel and football coaching in young offender institutions. Here, Bell became a father figure to many troubled young men. In Willie Bell's case, he truly was born again, and it showed in his life. You must be born again is one of our Lord's most famous sayings. It is a comment that Jesus made during his encounter late at night with Nicodemus, a leading Pharisee and member of the Sanhedrin, a powerful Jewish ruling council of Sadducees, Pharisees, and scribes presided over by the acting high priest. In fact, the comment was made twice in a very short space of time. Here, as part of verse 7, where we read, you must be born again. And earlier in verse 3, where Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. It is also effectively implied here in verse 5. I tell you the truth, unless a man is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Nowadays, the term born again has at times entered into our common speech. And in doing so, of course, has become somewhat, if not greatly, abused. People have an intense emotional experience and thereafter claim to be born again. Or they have a radical change of opinion on some perhaps political or moral issue and they are born again. So let us turn to this subject of being born again, the new birth. And I'd like to deal briefly with it this evening under five main headings. 
the necessity of the new birth, and then its purposes, its source, its means, and its effects. So first of all, the necessity of the new birth. There are many scripture passages we could cite to remind us of man's sinful nature, inherited <coughs> from Adam, and of how that sinful nature inclines us from birth to rebel against God. In the book of Judges, written perhaps around 1000 BC, the sheer sinfulness and rebelliousness of Israel, God's chosen people, is summed up in one simple, stark phrase that occurs on more than one occasion. Chapter 17, verse 6, or chapter 21, verse 25. In those days, Israel had no king. Everyone <coughs> did as he saw fit. Everyone did as he saw fit. In Romans chapter 8, verses 6 to 8, Paul tells us, the mind of sinful man is death because the sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. And earlier in Romans chapter 1, from verse 18 onwards, the apostle warned of how man's godlessness and wickedness have incurred God's wrath, of how despite the fact that God's existence is evident to mankind, for example, in creation, men have chosen to ignore that existence. They prefer the darkness of sin, the foolishness of unbelief, and the worship of created things to that of the creator. They prefer unnatural relations to natural ones. And he speaks that there is wickedness, greed, <coughs> depravity, gossip, arrogance, and boastfulness on all sides. By nature, we are born in sin. By nature, we are not inclined towards God. And in our world, we are surrounded by abomination and perversion on all sides, dealing with every part of life, from the cradle to the grave. Martin Lloyd-Jones reminds us that the world is not interested in the affairs of the soul at all and tries to avoid considering them. It is spiritually dead in trespasses and sins and regards spiritual things as utterly boring. It wants to enjoy the world and is out for the glittering prizes that it has to offer. One biblical example, for instance, would be that of the prodigal son. Friends, I don't need to go into specific examples from our world in 2024 to prove that Paul's assertions 2,000 years ago or Lloyd Jones's views 50 years ago still hold true today. On one of the days I was preparing this sermon, word came through that the British House of Commons had voted to force schools in Northern Ireland to teach students aged 11 to 16 years old about abortion. What a sad reflection of the influences being brought to bear upon our political decision makers and ultimately upon our children at this time. As I said earlier, the phrase born again is widely used, but is it widely understood? When Jesus used it here in relation to spiritual birth, Nicodemus thought only of physical birth. How can a man be born when he is old? He asked, are people today any different? The experience of one well-known pastor would indicate not. The late Warren Wearsby says, 
when you talk to people about being born again, they often begin to discuss their family, its religious heritage, their church membership, religious ceremonies, and so on. That seems to be what they're interested in. If ever evidence was needed that mankind must be born again, we have it here in John chapter 3. This spiritual leader of Israel, Nicodemus, supposedly an educated expert in the law and the scriptures, seems to have very limited understanding of profound spiritual matters. In response to Jesus twice telling him that he must be born again, all he could say was, how can this be? To which Jesus replies with a degree of incredulity. You are Israel's teacher and you do not understand these things? In verse 7, Jesus could not be more clear. You must be born again. And so, friends, it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter the family you come from, the church you go to, the job you have, the number of letters after your name. All of us were born in sin and conceived in iniquity. We must be born again. It was true for Nicodemus, who probably thought his place in the kingdom of God was guaranteed. It is true for everyone who has ever lived. And it's true for you and me. The necessity of the new birth. <coughs> Secondly, its purpose. The purpose of the new birth. This is all very well, you may say, but what is the purpose of this new birth? Well, I think we may identify two main purposes. The first is to show God's wonderful love for the world. God's wonderful love for the world. John 3 verse 16 is perhaps the best known verse in all of Scripture. And it provides the answer to this question. Jesus says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Quite simply, the reason there is a new birth from above is that God loved the world and God continues to love the world. The world has rebelled against him. It denies his glory. It rejects his authority. It despises his will. The evidence was all around in Jesus' day, and it is all around us in our day. But God so loved the world. That is why there is a rebirth. And how different is God's love from ours? We love when there is something lovable, something lovely to us. But God loves the unloved and the unlovely. God loves this world. War in Ukraine, the effects of which are seen daily on our TV screens or in people we meet or have heard about in our towns, our schools, or even our churches. Gaza. Refugees fleeing to Europe from Africa or Syria, drowning in the Mediterranean. Starvation in Africa. Islamic persecution in dozens of countries. At home, a growing mental health crisis. A breakdown in social care. Assaults on women food banks, and the cost of living calamity. People are always saying, why doesn't God do something? But he has. He has given the new birth, the new creation, the resurrection of life through Jesus Christ. This means there is hope for the world. There is hope 
for each one of us. We can have a new start. Why? Because God so loved. You can have a new life. How? By receiving God's gift through faith in his son. You can have a new beginning. Be a new man or a new woman. Friends, is there any message more glorious, more wonderful, more important than that? Light has come into the world. How can this be? Because God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And the second purpose, the new birth is necessary in order to enter the kingdom of God. In order to enter the kingdom of God. This is the point that Jesus made to Nicodemus here in verse 5. In other words, unless you are made a new person, you cannot be saved. You might identify Jesus as a great teacher, an influential historical figure but you will not enter the kingdom of God. For apart from God's regenerating work, you are neither willing to be saved nor even interested in salvation. As Jesus says here in verse 6, flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. The world is spiritually dead in its sins. Only the born again, born from above Christian, has been made spiritually alive. He or she is most concerned about the affairs of the soul. They are the things that come first in his life and in all his thinking. In fact, we could go back a step here and argue that not only must one be born again to enter the kingdom of God, as verse 5 says, but it is necessary even to see the kingdom of God. Look at verse 3. Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Think again of Nicodemus. He was a learned scholar. He witnessed Jesus performing his miracles in Jerusalem. He probably had some idea of what was meant by the kingdom of God. But at that point, he had no real knowledge of spiritual things. He needed a new heart from God, a new light in the mind. As Paul later wrote in 1 Corinthians 2 verse 14, The man without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. So the key point here is that if you have not been born again by the sovereign grace of God, you not only cannot enter the kingdom of God, but also you cannot see it even when it is in front of your eyes. What you need is humble repentance and grace to cry out to God for mercy. Friends, isn't this a warning to all of us who are believers that without the illuminating work of God's Spirit, our labor, too, is all in vain. The purposes of the new birth, to show God's wonderful love, to enter the kingdom of God. (coughs) And thirdly, its source, the source of the new birth. To where do we turn for the new birth? The rebirth is God's work, not man's. Just as we do not bring about our natural birth, So our spiritual rebirth is not our work. It is the work of God. It is the work of his grace. As Leon Morris observes, 
entry into the kingdom is not by way of human striving, but by that rebirth which only God can effect. Turning back to the phrase, born again, its alternative translation from the original Greek word anothen is from above. So born again means born from above. A supernatural birth from above. That is of God. In Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 26 to 27, a passage that Nicodemus himself should have been familiar with, there is no better summary in all of Scripture of the source of the new birth. Ezekiel 36, 26, and 27 says this. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. That is God speaking. God alone is the source of the new birth. Fourthly, it's means, the means of the new birth. Like Nicodemus in verse 9, we may well ask, how can this be? Or by what means does God provide the new birth? Well, here in chapter 3, verses 14 and 15, we read of how Jesus used the illustration of the lifting up of the snake in the desert in the days of Moses, which takes us back to Numbers chapter 21. You may recall that there we read of how the Israelite camp was attacked by biting snakes. God had Moses make a snake of bronze and set it on a pole so that those who looked up at it were healed from these bites. Our Lord compares that to he himself ultimately being lifted up, lifted up on a cross at Calvary. Christ's sacrificial death was God's plan for the rebirth of sinners. On that cross, Christ took upon himself the penalty for our sins. As we picture that scene in our minds and think about its purpose, may we receive the grace from God through the Spirit to believe in its significance. Christ crucified is bearing our sin. As we look to him in faith, we are born again. Christ lifted up on the cross is God's provision for those dead in sin who must be born again. The cross is the means by which Jesus secures the spirit for the regeneration of our hearts. We cannot procure a new birth for ourselves, but God, through Christ, has done so for us. Faith in him and in his sacrifice for sinners is the means of the new birth. So its necessity, its purposes, its source, and its means. Fifthly and finally, its effects, the effects of the new birth. Friends, the new birth has a purpose and it is recognizable by its visible effects. Earlier I quoted from Ezekiel chapter 36. In the following chapter, 37, we read that great passage about the valley of dry bones where the breath of the Spirit of God comes and brings life. Ezekiel 37 and verse 9 says this, 
This is what the Sovereign Lord says. Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe into these slain that they may live. This well matches what Jesus is talking about here in verse 8. In both cases, the blowing of the Holy Spirit causes spiritually dead people to show signs of life. The point is that new life is the evidence of the new birth, of having been born again. If there are no signs of a new and different life, then there is no reason to think that there has been a rebirth. As I said earlier, we come into this world with a thoroughly fallen nature, without faith or love or fear of God. Only a power from above makes us spiritual. To give new life is the peculiar prerogative of God. Without it, we cannot go to heaven. To receive it produces not merely superficial changes, but rather a thorough change of heart, will, and character. It is a new creation and the passing from death to life. It is the implanting in our dead hearts of a new principle from above. As J.C. Ryle says, it is the calling into existence of a new creature with a new nature, new habits of life, new tastes, new appetites, new judgments, new opinions, new hopes, and new fears. Friends, can you identify with any or all of that? If so, you possess the privileges of Christ's kingdom. In conclusion, I'd like to finish by mentioning a book entitled Born Again, very old copy. Published in 1976, it is part of the life story of Charles Coulson. I don't know if any of those of you of a certain age are familiar with that name. In the early 1970s, Coulson was nicknamed the White House Hatchet Man. He was special counsel to American President Richard Nixon, and he was a lawyer of some repute. But in 1974, Coulson admitted to being involved in the Watergate scandal, which led eventually to Nixon's resignation. Coulson himself served seven months in jail, and his political career, like Nixon's, was effectively over. But the previous year, Coulson came to faith and became an evangelical Christian. He was born again. He went on to found an organization called Prison Fellowship International, and prior to that, Prison Fellowship in America, which ministered to the needs of those in prison, bringing them the message of Christian hope through the gospel of faith in Jesus Christ. For over 30 years, he traveled the world to speak at events, usually in prison, in prisons. I even remember him coming to Belfast at one stage. He wrote over 30 books and received 15 honorary doctorates. He died in 2012. Friends, the challenge is there for all of us. Are you born again? Have you humbly submitted to the Lord Jesus Christ? Are you now living for him? Do you have that assurance that one day you will be with him in glory evermore in his kingdom? I pray that you have. There are so many inspiring examples of men and women who have been so born. Six-year-old Jim Elliot telling his mother that Jesus could come whenever he wanted 
because he was saved now. 17-year-old Hudson Taylor, reading a tract in a Barnsley warehouse and falling to his knees in humble submission. 17-year-old Johnny Erickson, permanently paralyzed after a diving accident and suffering years of depression and anger before coming to saving faith. And so many more coming to saving faith later in life who don't become relatively famous like those whom I've just mentioned. An ongoing challenge for us as born-again believers is how fruitful are our lives? Is there fruit in what we say, in our attitudes to our work, in our parenting, in our neighborliness, in our approach to church and to worship? Could we exhibit more of those fruits of the Spirit of which Paul writes to the Galatians? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. It's interesting that both Charles Coulson and Willie Bell identified those who were behind bars, whether young offenders or criminals, as their target audience for work and witness. But we must always remember that we don't have to be behind bars to be in prison. We are all prisoners of our fallen human nature. <coughs> Jesus Christ comes to set the prisoner free. By humbly submitting to him in faith, we are set free. We are born again. Amen.